So let's talk about Next.js 15 RC, the release candidate that was made available yesterday, and the upcoming features coming in Next.js 15, probably sometime down in the line in October this year, because that's usually when they release major versions of Next.js, but we get to uh, test them and play around with these features now before they become stable later on. So let's dive right into this. Now, to test this out in an existing project, you can just run this script to upgrade your Next and React and React DOM version to the RC version. Now, React 19 RC was also released after React Conf in about a week ago. Now, we have been using some of these new features from the Canary channel that's accessible in Next.js app. But now Next.js 15 RC is going to support everything that comes in React 19 RC, including the new React compiler, which we're going to talk about shortly here. But I do have a video coming up on Tuesday, which is a more in-depth uh, dive into what React compiler is. And we're going to test it out playing inside the playground to actually understand it a bit better. So if you're interested into knowing what React Compiler is, which is uh, the major topic that the team talked about in the React Conf. If you haven't watched uh, the videos there, I'm going to also link in the descriptions uh, the live streaming of React Conf, a lot of good talks about React Compiler, about server components, and about what's changing in React 19. So definitely check it out. There's also a guide to upgrade to Next.js 15, also a guide for React 19 upgrade, and also a link here actually inside this blog post from the Next.js team to React Conf Keynote and the rest of the live stream. So let's start from the React compiler. Now, from a high level, compiler is going to understand JavaScript semantics and rules of React and is going to optimize your code. So instead of you having to manually optimize your code by APIs like use memo and use callback, it, you're going to just leave them out and the compiler is just going to go through your code because it understands JavaScript and rules of React and it's going to automatically memoize your code. So this is a high level introduction or explanation of what the compiler is supposed to be doing. We're going to experiment with this later on in the video that I have coming up for React Compiler. But now in Next.js 15 RC, we can actually have access to the React Compiler. All you need to do is to install this Babel plugin and then turn your Next.js config experimental flag for React Compiler to true, which enables this feature or this uh, new compiler inside of your Next.js app. Now there's nothing else that you need to do here to just benefit from this, this is just going to work. Now, optionally, you can also set some completion modes. I would refer to the documentation in React Compiler, which talks about every other framework's implementation of the compiler, such as Next.js and Remix and whatnot. So if you want to dive deeper into that, either check the React Compiler documentation or wait for our video that comes up, which I'm going to cover all of this in more details. Now, the other improvement in Next.js 15 is hydration error improvement. We have talked about this in Next.js 14.2. They're improving the error messages that you get as a result of hydration errors. Now, in Next.js 15, not only you get the stack, but you get the possible causes and the possible solutions for how to resolve them. For example, here, it is telling you why a hydration error might happen, such as a server client branch when you're checking the window, if you have different variable inputs such as date.now or math.random which is going to change any time that they're called the date formatting in the user's locale versus your server external changing data without sending a snapshot of it with the html so this is what causes your html or the content of your page being different from the server and the client and this is where you're going to get the hydration mismatch error and it also shows you where this is happening and a possible solution for it so they're improving on these errors because before you couldn't even know where, did, where where was it coming from we didn't even have this stack so it's good to know more so you can just trace it back and see what's happening there now as far as caching goes there's major changes happening 
in caching and I think this is an ongoing process is still developing one year after uh, the stable release of server components in Next.js. Now, they have changed some defaults in uh, the fetch function and the route handlers as well as uh, the client-side router cache in Next.js. Now, by default, fetch requests get route handlers and client router cache is set to cache and now the default is going to be uncached. So if you want to have the prior behavior, you have to now opt in. The default is not to cache anymore because initially Next.js, the way that it works was trying to optimize as much as possible so it was caching as much as possible. Your page components, your server components, your fetch requests, your get route handlers or API endpoints by default were cached. Even in the client router cache where you're using client-side navigation to, let's say, change pages, even the content of the page of the server component was cached in the router cache, which is uh, a cache inside of the browser. Now, all of this default is now turned back into being dynamic, so it's not cached anymore because a lot of people had confusions around using Next.js and the caching behavior, not understanding why uh, the content of the page or the data isn't changing, even though they thought they have a dynamic page. So let's look at them step by step. For example, in fetch requests, they're no longer cached by default. So you can pass a cache force cache if you want to uh, simulate the previous behavior. Otherwise, it won't be cached. You can have a no store or force cache for your fetch functions. Now, if you want to opt into the previous behavior or the caching behavior of the fetch, you can either set this option on this specific request or you can set some options at page level. So, for example, you can export this dynamic route config option and set it to force static for a single route or a layout. Or you can even change the fetch cache segment option. If you're not familiar what these are, these are um, segment options or config options that you can export from pages, layouts, and route handlers that set some config for your page or that specific route. Now, what we're talking about here is the fetch cache. So this is going to change the caching behavior of all of the fetch requests inside of that page or layout which you're going to use. If you set it to default cache and you don't and none of your fetch functions actually pass any caching specific option. It is going to default to caching all the fetch requests again. So if you want to opt into the previous behavior, you can pass this fetch cache segment config and set it to default cache. So there is another route config segment option that you can export from your pages layouts and you can set this dynamic to force dynamic or to force a static. In this case, if you wanted to go back to the way uh, Next.js used to be and then this is going to affect all of the fetch requests on that page. In a similar fashion the get route handlers or the get API endpoints used to be cached by default. Now since route handlers are a replacement for API endpoints and the way you think of API endpoints is you hit a server you get fresh data every time it was hard to wrap this around your head that the get request or a get API endpoint is going to be cached. But when you think about it, if you are hitting an API endpoint to fetching some data and no parameter from the request is read, no dynamic function such as the headers or cookies is read, there's really no reason why you need this get endpoint to be dynamic. So it would be benefiting from using the cache and that's the default behavior. But now again, in Next.js 15, the default behavior is not going to be cached and it is going to go back to being dynamic if you want to opt into the same behavior as it was before. You can export the dynamic segment option from your route handler and force it to static for it to be static. And the last thing as far as caching goes is the client side router cache. Now there's different layers of caching in Next.js and the one that we're talking about here is the router cache, it's called the router cache and it's the cache that lives inside the browser. This is for when, let's say you have a home page, you have an about page and you navigate to your about page. So your browser sends this request from your server components and already fetches the about page. Now, if you switch back to home page or go back to the about page, the page is not going to be refreshed. It's just going to use the router cache inside the browser from the same RSC payload that is already in 
the browser. This is also true if your page, the about page has been prefetched if you, let's say, hovered over a link that was linked to the about page. Now, in 14.2, they introduced this experimental stale time, which allowed you to manipulate or change uh, the time intervals for the router cache inside the browser to be revalidated. But now in Next.js 15, we're going back to not caching the results of our page components at all. And if you wanted to go back to the previous behavior for the router cache, you need to now pass in this stale time, set the dynamic to 30. If you look at the stale time here, you can see some defaults for this stale time. It has two properties, dynamic and static, and this depends on whether or not you're prefetching the links. But if you look at it, the dynamic property was zero seconds, not cached, and then for static, you had five minutes. So if you wanted to go back to this defaults, you have to specifically set them otherwise, uh, your page components won't be cached. Now, it doesn't make sense for a home page and an about page, but if you are fetching data inside of your page components or your server components and you want the data to be fresh every time, now it's going back to be dynamic every time or by default, so you no longer have to fight against the caching in Next.js to make your pages dynamic. If you wanted to optimize your pages that need to be static or would benefit from being static, you can then opt into being static. Now, the next thing coming up in Next.js 15 again is the incremental adoption of partial pre-rendering. Uh, we have a video on the channel talking about partial pre-rendering, so if you're not familiar with the concept, I'm going to include a link in the description so you can watch that out. Now, the incremental part to it, which is added in the Next.js 15 or this release candidate, is that instead of setting partial pre-rendering for the whole app, you can now decide on a page level, so they've added another config option or segment config option that you can export from your pages and layouts, which is experimental PPR, standing for partial pre-rendering. Set it to true to just do partial pre-rendering for this specific page, which allows you to incrementally adapt to partial pre-rendering. Now, from a high level, what partial pre-rendering does is that it allows you to have static and dynamic content at the same page. Now, the way that Next.js works before partial pre-rendering is that a route is either dynamic or static. If you're using any dynamic function or dynamic fetch requests, the whole route is going to be dynamic. And if you're not using, the whole route is going to be static. But partial pre-rendering allows you to have dynamic and static in the same page. So some parts of your page, like the shell, the header, the layout, can be static, and then the dynamic part can stream in. Again, watch the video that we have on the channel, like dive deeper into the details, but Basically, you're going to wrap the dynamic parts of your page component with a suspense. So the fallback is going to be streamed in from the initial request and the static shell. And then the rest is going to be streamed in once it's ready. Now with this uh, new incremental adoption, you can now just test and try this on specific pages rather than your whole application. Now what you need to do to use this is to set the experimental flag for PPR to incremental to be able to actually use this route config segment option. Another thing is to set this true, which is going to enable partial pre-rendering on all of your pages. So this is something that I'm really excited about coming into Next.js, which is going to make the performance of our Next.js apps even faster and also the perceived performance of our apps because once a user clicks on a specific page, they're going to instantly see the static parts even when they're navigating and then only the dynamic parts are going to be um, streamed in or coming in asynchronously, which is going to also improve the perceived performance of our app. Now, executing code after a response with the next after, this is completely new in uh, Next.js. Now, sometimes you may want to run other code beside the response that you send back to the user. Let's say you want to log, you want to sync data together, and your users don't have to necessarily wait for this um, extra job that you're doing to see the response or the page that they've requested for. So this after function is going to allow you to run or schedule some tasks to run after you have sent the response. And the reason why you need this is that your Next.js applications, your server components, and your server functions, actions, and API endpoints are deployed as serverless functions. And in serverless functions, once you send a response and you close that response or streaming, there's really no way that that compute segment or whatever virtual machine that was spun up to run this serverless function 
or container is, is now eliminated or deleted or evaporated. So it no longer is there to run anything after that. But with this after function, we are now able to schedule tasks that it's not necessarily relevant to the user, but it's for our own plumbing into this function that runs after the response was sent to the user. Now to use it again, you need to pass this experimental flag to your next config. And as the example you can see here, we're going to also test this together inside of a brand new Next.js app. You can import it from Next server and run it inside of your layout, for example, here to log something into your logging system. And the primary response from this page component will be sent to the user. And this is going to only run as the secondary task. Now, the next thing or the next update is an update to create Next app script to create Next.js application. So you have a new design, but also a new setup that allows you to set Turbo Pack or choose Turbo Pack for your local development. Now, Turbo Pack is still not passed uh, for production, but you can use it in development. Now, I've heard that Turbo Pack is passing 100% of the tests, even in production, but for now, it's only available in development. Now, if you run the Create Next app and use the RC at the end, this is what we're going to do together in a second, uh, you can then, you're then faced with this option to choose whether or not you want to use Turbo Pack. Now, from a high level, Turbo Pack is an alternative or the successor to Webpack. It's an incremental JavaScript build tool. It makes locally developing Next.js apps and the hot module reload way faster. It's written in Rust. I don't have a video on the channel for this. But um, later on, it, when it becomes a stable, maybe we also dive deeper into Turbo Pack and have a dedicated video for this. But with the new Create Next app, you now have the option to select whether or not you want to use Turbo Pack. Again, now only for development, but soon probably also in production. Uh, or you can also pass in this Turbo flag uh, even now to use Turbo Pack in your local development. And uh, it's, it's now included in the config as you're installing a brand new Next.js app. Now, another flag has been added to create Next app to create an empty project without the styling and all uh, this main homepage that we usually delete. You can pass in the dash dash empty so that you get just a simple hello world page and empty shell for your Next.js app application. Now, the next update is a bunch of configs you could pass into for external packages or exclude packages from your server component bundle or uh, using transpile packages in Next.js or asking Next.js to transpile some of the packages that was used inside your code um, from the pages router and the app router. Now to unify the config between the app and the pages router, they've introduced this new uh, two config uh, options that you can pass into your next config that again allows you to exclude packages from your server components or include some transport packages into your component. Now with this out of the way, let's just go back into our code and see this new release candidate project in action. So we're going to use the create next app RC. It's coming to the command terminal here, pm pm dlx and then create next app at RC. And I'm going to use the current working directory. I'm using pmpm. If you're using npx, you can, you can just run npx create next app at RC. I haven't passed the turbo flag or the empty. So if we're going to go through these questions, would you like to, to use TypeScript? Yes. Yes, lint. Yes. Tail and CSS. Yes. Source directory. No app router. Yes. And now we have the turbo pack for next dev. I'm going to select yes. Import aliases is fine. We're going to wait for this to install. And I'm going to also show you that after uh, function that you can call to schedule a task for after the page component has rendered. And we're going to test this out together. While we're here, let's also update our PMPM package as well. So let me run this real quick. Okay, great. So let's PMPM dev. Let's see if we can see a difference between running Turbo Pack locally. So let's open up our new application. The first thing that we would notice probably is that the style or the design has changed for the homepage. Here we go, a new style for our homepage. Let's go to our application. Let's close this terminal from a high level. We have the layout. Um, if we're going to talk about fonts that has changed in Next.js 15 or it's going to change in Next.js 15 in a second shortly, we are using some local fonts, specifically the gist 
font from Vercel. Um, it is now included in this local package and we're using the next font local to run this or load this fonts into our application. Everything else is pretty much the same. Inside of our page, we have a new design, as I mentioned. Now let's go back and actually use this after function we just saw here. So let's import this next after from server components. Go to our page and let's bring it inside of our page. I can bring it inside of a layout so we can see it better, but let's do it inside of a page, which actually makes it more interesting. So here I am importing this after from the next server and let's just call this after and then lock something to the console. So I'm going to call the after function and then I'm going to run a function that's just basically logging something. So let's just console log. This will run after the page is rendered. Now I want to also have a console log inside of the page component itself that says this is from the page itself. Now what I'm trying to do or to see is that this console log needs to be happening first because with this after we're going to send the response which is our page component, sorry, our page component back to the user first and then this function that we're passing into the after is scheduled to run after the response has been sent to the user. So if I go back to my terminal now and let's refresh our application okay i'm getting the error here because i haven't specifically set this option in my next.js config so let's go to next config we're going to open the experimental flag and then an option and then say after to true let's save this up i don't think we need to restart this so let's try it Okay, so I can see the page here, but if you pay attention to the console here, uh, sorry if this is too small, but this is uh, the first log in the console is from the page component itself. So going back to the page, let me close this off too. So I'm seeing this console log first, and then once the page component renders and I see this page, and the user receives the response. Now, whatever we schedule into this after function is running after, so this will run after the page rendered which is the message that I have passed into this console log. So this is pretty cool. It just reminds me of the way that middleware functions work in Express so that you can hand off the response back to the user but still schedule some tasks to be done later before you're calling next to kind of pass the torch to the next middleware. Now, before we wrap the video up, I want to also go to this upgrading to version 15 guide from Next.js or from the perspective of our Next.js. Again, if you want to update uh, your existing project, you can run any of these commands depending on whatever package manager that you're using to update Next, React, React DOM, and also Next uh, ESLint. You can also update your TypeScript versions to the latest versions. Now, the minimum React version required is going to be 19 for this update to work. Again, for the fetch requests, they're not going to by default be cached. If you want to cache, you have to pass the force cache. Otherwise, they would be dynamic. This we have already talked about. The rat handlers is the same. For them, if you're not using the fetch function, you can just pass in a config segment option or specifically the dynamic segment option. Pass it to force a static to again simulate the previous behavior. Otherwise, it would be dynamic. And same thing for the client side router cache. This is the cache that lives inside the browser that caches the result or the RSC payload. That's your server components. And by default, now they're going to go back to dynamic. If you want to set them into any other amount, you can pass this a stale time, which changes how often the cache inside of the router cache in the browser will be updated or revalidated. So you can play around with this or set it back to also caching or simulating the previous behavior. Now, something we didn't talk about in the notes is the next font. Now, next font package moved from the at next font to the next font itself. So it's moved into the next uh, package itself, something to note. And inside of our project, as you saw in the layout, we are now using a local font called gist. I'm, I hope that I'm saying the name right. Uh, from Vercel itself. You can search it up and go to the resources to download this in your projects if you want. I think it's a free font that you can use in any project. Next.js applications obviously come with this font from this point on. Now this is again about your dependencies, your external packages, 
We talked about them, server, external packages, and unifying this bundle behavior or the options between the pages router and the app router. And that's a wrap for this video, folks. These are the new features coming in Next.js 15. Further down the line, probably sometime in October this year, that's usually when they have major releases in Next.js. Some of the new APIs we've already tested and tried in React Canary Channel through the app router, but some of them are new. Some of them are Next.js specific APIs like this after function we just tested here. I wouldn't push this to production yet. It's a still in release candidate channel. It's a still experimental. It's for us to get to know, to learn, and to warm ourselves up for what's coming down the line. But we can also test them out in our applications and provide feedback to the team to shape and form how this are going to become stable down in the line in Next.js 15. If you have any questions, like always, hit me up in the comments. I also want to thank you for supporting my work. We recently hit 60,000 subscribers. So thank you to everyone who is liking, sharing, commenting, and engaging with my content or subscribing to the channel one way or another, supporting my work. As a give back, I am dropping a sale on my course. So if you're interested in learning Next.js, I do have a course and there's a link in the description. There's a sale going on until the end of May. And since I published the course back a year ago, I've been updating it with this new releases in Next.js and as the app router has been evolving. So it's a living, breathing course in that I update it often. So check it out, link in the description and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.